Aloha and welcome to the NFLRC Selecting and Adapting Materials for Online Language Learning and Teaching webinar. This project is funded with support from a grant from the U.S. Department of Education. Again, I want to welcome everybody and thank you for making the time to join us. We appreciate your attendance. And for our fifth session, we are going to start off with selecting and adapting online materials for the presentational mode of communication. And to help us out on this topic, we have with us today, Dr. Anna Oskoff. She is a professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where she teaches courses in Spanish and second language acquisition. She is currently the chair of the Modern Languages, Linguistics and Intercultural Communication Department. Dr. Oskos' research focuses on the development of second language digital literacies. The goal of her investigations has been to bring ecological validity, examining L2 writing practices as they take place in the L2 classroom rather than in the experimental context by means of mainly qualitative but also quantitative analysis, capitalizing on the power that social platforms and involving students in social justice and civic engagement issues, she has engaged in several transatlantic telecollaborative projects between the United States and Spain. Dr. Anna Oskoff is also the co-editor of the Calico Journal published by Equinox. Dr. Oskoff, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We're very happy to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Uh, welcome everybody and thank you for coming to my presentation, Selecting and Adopting Online Materials for the Presentational Mode of Communication. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of you at the National Foreign Language Research Center for inviting me to be part of this web webinar series on selecting and adapting materials for online language learning and teaching. So as the title of the, present, uh, of the presentation indicates, I'm going to focus on the presentational mode, which has been defined, uh, which places the learner as a speaker or writer for a distant audience, one with whom the person has either very limited interaction or the interaction is not limited, not possible. Uh, this type of uh, communication can be tailored to different type of audiences and both in the case of writing and speaking, it can have uh, adopts adapted com community conventions of genre and style. Uh, for example, we can have a podcast which is very different from a presentation on a PowerPoint uh, or we can have an expository essay, which is very different from an argumentative essay or from a narrative essay. Uh, usually, the outcome can be planned, uh, is usually planned and formalized speech. And the learner, in this case, is in the presentational mode, has the opportunity to draft, obtain feedback, and revise before publication or broadcast. Given that the presentational mode, uh, we are talking about something that the learner is producing, it seems a little bit of an opposition that we are talking about selecting and adapting online materials when we have the speaker or the writer producing something. But what we need to take into account is that this person, the speaker of the writer, is uh, getting, retrieving the information from somewhere, and that that somewhere is today very often uh, the internet is online. Uh, so what I would like to do is place the presentational mode in a wider context and we are going to talk about literacy, how, how we understand literacy and how we understand digital literacy that sometimes they have put as opposed to each other or as very different but in reality they have the same foundation. And then I would like to talk a few elements that are related to the adapting and selecting materials and the presentational mode and are related to the hybridity that we are living now. We are just not talking, the multimodality, sorry. We are not talking just about the oral mode or the written mode. We are talking about a combination of modes. And I also would like to talk hybridity, how we are using different uh, text and we are just mixing and getting them together and we are creating a different new content and what it implies in terms of uh, ownership and in terms of plagiarism which are elements that we need to take into account when we are 
retrieving information from another source. So uh, traditionally, literacy has been defined, and here I'm going to follow Pennycock in 2001, has been defined as uh, the acquisition of a series of the coding and encoding skills necessary to read and write, in our case, using a foreign alphabet or writing system in the context of unchanging, rule-governed, monomodal, and static linguistic elements. Now, the internet has a uh, revolution and the proliferation of tools that we have at our hand. We have uh, podcasts, we have wikis, we have chats, we have blogs, uh, we have Twitter, um, has changed our notion of literacies. And now they are seen as social practices that are fluid, sociocultural, multimodal, and dynamic. Are, are exercised as individuals, but not just by themselves, but as part of a larger group, because we communicate with others much more, perhaps, than before. And that supports the cause of writers and speakers and audiences and the social relationships among them, between them. And here, here we are going to talk a lot about the social interaction. Now, what I want to say, what I said before, and I want to repeat again, is that litera literacy and digital literacies are not in opposition and are not completely different. We should consider that the foundation is the same, but the approach is different. In the same way that we, uh, that as before we had, before we had the computers, our students still today need to retrieve information before they used to go to the library, or we used to go to the library. We used to try to find books to get um, ideas for our activities. We need to get that information. We need to evaluate. We need to reflect on it and create a new meaning with it. The difference is that the tools that we are using today are different. And the potential audiences that we have today are changing in terms of quality and quantity and in terms of diversity. So we can reach to a larger audience and that audience might be likely different from what we would have been able to reach before. So we have did literacy and digital literacy, which have the same foundation but are have different characteristics at the same time. Uh, digital literacy is also intersected with other types of literacy, uh, which are related to communication skills. We have, for example, computer literacy, which is the competency to use and make use of technology. Um, this refers to the use of different tools. We have podcasts, we have wikis, we have PowerPoints like here. Uh, information literacy, which is the ability to find and evaluate information. And media literacy, which is the critical awareness of media representations and their, their ideological purposes. We must understand that, for example, the type of images that we are used to accompany the oral and written text and the oral and written text that we produce too, but the type of images, all the sources that we are putting together and the tools that we are using, for example, Facebook or digital stories that can be uploaded to YouTube or a blog, all of these tools and so, uh, semiotic resources have implications regarding the message that is conveyed and to how many people and how many people will potentially have access to that information. So when we are discussing uh, helping our students select and adapt online materials to, crea to create their own text, or when we are selecting and adapting materials to create uh, our own text, we are looking for skills that go beyond the technology and the materials themselves. Being able to be digitally literate and being able to present information requires a change in how we think. Uh, it does not imply only how to learn, how to use a blog, how to create a collaborative blog, but it becomes 
uh, for instructional purposes, but it becomes helping ourselves and our students to become active users of technology and successful communicators in everyday life. Um, so when considering, uh, and now we are moving towards a little more towards the content, when considering the uh, presentational mode, the content uh, the students will be producing and uh, from where they will be selecting it and how they will be selecting it and the tool, how they will be using to present it, uh, all those components should be considered. So many of us are already familiar with many of the tools that we have available um, and here we have a few of them. This does not mean that we as, instru as instructors and also our students know how to use them for instructional purposes. Um, our students probably are even savvier users of these technologies, these digital, digital tools, more than we are. They know they might not always know how to use them for professional purposes. The idea that our students are native uh, users of technology has been debunked. Even though it is true that they might be digitally wise in their personal life, uh, they still don't know how to use it. And we might still know, you, know how to use it for instructional purposes. Um, an element that we need to remember is that we might use has to use Instagram for our personal purposes. We might go to a trip and upload an image and write something, something, or we can do the same with Twitter. But it doesn't mean that we know as instructors and students to write, to produce rhetorically sophisticated text that we would expect in the type of presentational mode. So going back to these tools that we have here, um, we are going to see that in some of these tools, we are using more than one mode. For example, when we are using podcasts, we are pretty much speaking there. But when we are using blogs, we combine the written mode and the visual mode. So we see that the presentational mode to some extent has changed. A few years ago, we were just focusing on oral or written mode. Now we have the text, but we have the images. In a blog, we can even have a video uploaded. PowerPoint, well, we could say a PowerPoint is mostly written, but we are presenting also the PowerPoint like I am doing now. So we can combine both. And again, we can also include a movie, a video. So we are adding another mode here. Uh, we also have Twitter, which is a presentation, uh, we would say is the written mode, but we also have images. Instagram, which would be visual and written presentational mode. So right now, when we are thinking of presentational mode, we need to expand our horizons of what it means. And this brings us to multimodality. Um, and what we are going to see when we are looking for information online is that we are just not going to find an, a web page, for example, just with written text. We are going to find the different modes. Uh, what we need to know is that we cannot think, we need to understand that these modes are helping each other. And it's not that they are helping each other by replicating the same information, but they are providing different sides of the same information. And I'm going to show you a few examples here now. Um, so let me go to the examples. So this is an activity I do with my students. This is for an advanced Spanish class. Uh, history and culture Spanish class. And the final project they have is to work on a trip in, in Spain. They have to work on a 15 day long trip. To do so throughout the semester, the students have to work in Google Maps. They have to create, they have to put different pins as you can see here. Uh, and they have to develop an entry like we something that we will find in a travel book. They need to find the information from somewhere. They usually do it from the internet. 
But what I tell them is that they can they cannot copy and paste. They make it. They need to make it their own, and still they need to put the references at the end. And they need to find an image that is copyright free images. So as you can see, we are combining in Google Maps. We are um, working on the genre of a travel entry, like a travel book entry, which is a genre in itself. And we are including the visual mode, which is what we would expect. Another activity that I ask my students to do is uh, they need to work on several proposals for a final project. So on a blog, they need to think of what type of project they are going to do and they need to send it to me. And that would be something that we would be more familiar with. And this would be the typical reading presentational mode. Um, in another activity I do in my class, my students also have to work on a blog, and this is me, my, my own presentation. Uh, but they have to work on a blog. They need to include information about the different topics, art, linguistic diversity, economy, politics, religion. And throughout the semester in this history class that we call from the ancient times up to current times, we need to talk about how the history of Spain, um, how diversity, uh, linguistic diversity, the politics, economy, religion, nationalism has shaped what has happened in Spain today, how everything has taken up to, the, to what is happening now. So throughout the semester, the students work in, on different entries in the blog, and they have to combine information that they are researching Again, they need to make it their own. It's not just about copying it and pasting it. They need to understand it. And they need to include uh, images, which are copyright images, that are supporting the, the image. Um, in another activity, which would be for the presentational mode, is when I ask students to complete um, um, digital story, tell a digital story. I have done this in one of my advanced, I have done this in lower level courses and advanced level courses. It's usually the final product of the whole semester. And the idea is that they, in this particular case, they are looking at one intercultural experience they have had in their, in their life. And they need to develop a narrative and they need to justify, they need to combine it with images that helps them explain the story. Uh, the idea, the process is uh, we look at the language, we work on the narrative. So here we see the draft, the feedback that they are getting from the structure. And at the same time, they are looking for images, which they would be getting online or uh, the structure would be getting online to help them support their meaning. Um, another activity which I have asked students to do, which is also based on research uh, that they get online, is to talk about different topics such as immigration, about globalization, about ecological issues in the uh, Spanish speaking world. And they write, and they, at the end of the class, they prepare a podcast. So in this case, I'm going to show you, uh, you're going to listen to specific example, just a very brief example, in which one student is uh, presenting their research. This is a group of, this is a team of two. They are presenting their research that they have done uh, in terms of immigration in the United States. Hola, vamos a hablar sobre el tema de la inmigración y la actitud de los inmigrantes en Estados Unidos y cómo es relacionado con la ley Arizona Senate Bill 1070. Es, es importante hoy especialmente con la elección de Donald Trump y sus planes en contra de la inmigración. ¿Qué es la All right. Uh, so the idea, everything, all that podcast was based on the research that they had completed. So in addition to multimodality, that is something that we need to ourselves take into account when we are selecting and adopting materials and we need to teach our students to do that when they are working on developing products in the presentational mode, 
we need to look at hybridity, uh, which is the mixing and remixing of all new content, semiotic resources, genres, media, and or cultural materials to create new meaning. Uh, hybridity today takes place because it's very easy. The internet makes it very easy for us to retrieve information and to produce new different type of text that, and we are in, that include the work of others. Now we need to be very careful and understand that hybridity doesn't mean uh, that we are copying the work of others. Um, remixes and mashups are required, like you can see in that image here, require a creative reworking of the source mat material so that when it is placed in a new content, it has a new significance, it has a new meaning, like in this meme that we have here. Uh, what is important here is that when we are selecting and adapting materials and we are creating these new remixes or mashups, um, we need to understand creativity is not just a solitary endeavor, but we are working upon the work of others. Origin, origin, originality does not come only from our own ideas or from borrowing ideas on images and other answers from others, but it becomes for how we are using this content to create new content, a new novel use of ideas. It's not just new content. It's a novel use of ideas and other answers. Um, so what I also want to say is that it's not that we have we have always used the words of others. When we are talking, let me go back, when we have talked, when we are working on a paper, we are citing uh, others' work. We are, uh, like I'm doing here, I'm citing other works, I'm coding. So we always, we have always done that, but we need to, but in this case, when we are adding the different semiotic resources is even further. Uh, so with this idea of remixing and using other people's sources, we need to be aware of ownership. Um, ownership refers to intellectual property and copyright. And it refers to the, to the fair use of external sources by acknowledging and creating ideas. Um, images and the collective range of semiotic resources that might be included in students' multimodal projects. Uh, something that is interesting, and this goes back to current in 2015, is that when we are working with online resources, authentic authentication and citation is not part of the mashup culture. However, this, this becomes an issue, and as educators, this is becoming an issue for us when we take something from their native uh, land, from wherever it was produced, and we are using, for example, for instructional purposes. To some extent, we have some leeway because we are using it for educational purposes, but don't, don't take that for granted. So in my case, and I always tell this to my students every time I catch something online. And you might have noticed that I have been including in many of the cases, I have included my sources. Um, in others, no, because they were copyright free. Um, in like, uh, what I ask my students is to always uh, provide the source where they are getting the information from. Uh, in this case, my students were working on a blog and they were talking about different topics. And they were in this case where they were talking about nationalism and patriotism. And they, they talk about what they found and they talk about their opinions and they were quick to find, uh, to include the resource uh, from, the, from which they got the information. So when we are looking at ownership, uh, there are a few questions that we need to ask ourselves of the time. Does the author or do we credit and cite those whose ideas we have included in our work? Do, do we invite uh, those who are looking at our work to confirm that the material is, 
publicly available. And what is, uh, steps do we take to make sure that we obtain permission for copyrighted material? So talking about that, one activity I do with my students, and I make sure I do that with them, is uh, look for images which are copyright images, which is uh, probably we are much more um, used to citing written work, but when it comes to images, we free range. Uh, so I tell them, and I'm going to show you here, I show them how to look for the images in Google. Um, in Google. So in this case, we were talking about Isabel de Castilla. We were looking at um, what was happening in Spain at that time in 1492. So they were looking for images, advanced search, and when you scroll down, you can look at usage rights. And I always try to use free of use, even commercially. And they click on an image, and when they click there in that image that you have there, you have all the information about the image. I know you are going to talk about this in the future, so I'm not going to spend more time about this. But since we are talking about the presentational mode and now how the presentational mode has expanded to include written, oral, and other different modes, it's an element that we need to take into account. No. All right, so that's the idea of using materials that are placed under Creative Commons license, and you will hear more about that. So when we are talking about text, we tend to be a little bit safer, uh, but many times, because it's so easy to copy and paste from the internet, we don't realize that we actually cannot just copy and paste, but we need to understand what we are reading, and we need to make it our own. That's how we adapt online text, and this is not how we copy online text. So first of all, when we read something, make sure that we understand the meaning, that students understand the meaning, um, that we are able to explain the idea in different words, changing a sentence, changing the words of a sentence by looking at different synonyms doesn't work. Um, and definitely write sources appropriately. So to conclude, um, as we help our students select and adapt materials, and as we ourselves select and adapt materials for online language learning and, uh, and teaching, uh, we need to remember that we have entered into a world of possibilities that did not exist before. As I mentioned before, the presentational mode has changed. Uh, we just don't talk about the written or the oral mode independently, but they can be combined, as we can see in a narrated PowerPoint, or we can see in a digital story where we have the oral, the written, the textual mode. We have images that change sizes. All those are conveying meaning that we didn't have a way to do before, but every time that we are expanding an image or making it smaller, we are creating meaning, which is helping us understand something in a way that it was not possible before we had these tools. So while students are savvy users of all these modes um, and different modes, uh, outside, different tools outside of the class and even when we know how to use different modes and tools outside of the class, it is our responsibility to teach ourselves and teach our students how to use them for instructional purposes. Uh, second, the wide cast of resources that we have online for a potential use also brings the responsibility of using them appropriately. This is not different from what happened prior to having the internet or having the computer we still, when we were still citing and referencing previous work. But perhaps the possibilities that we have, and perhaps sometimes we think that whatever's in the internet is an anonymous, it has no author. 
we forget that someone produces it and we forget that someone offered it and that has to be credited. As we move forward, therefore, there is no doubt that as uh, we select and adopt online materials, a new world in which we create and co-create meaning is ahead of us. Now it is the best, it's up to us to make the best of it. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. We have a lot of great questions and conversations going in the chat right now. Uh, to start us off, just to make sure that we are on the same page, is your course taught as a face-to-face -face course, a hybrid course, or an online course? It is theoretically taught as a face-to-face -face course, but my students do a lot of online work. And the reason is because it gives them the time to think and reflect on ideas. So every time they work on a blog, they are actually doing research to talk about a specific topic. Definitely. And I could see how a course with a format like this would lend itself very nicely to a hybrid format, but even in a face-to-face -face format, yeah. this is fantastic that yeah. students are getting uh, this kind of experience. A lot of our questions that came in surrounded things related to um, training students on how to use different tools, getting them up to speed with being able to do things like putting um, a blog together, um, especially for some of our adult learners that might be a little bit hesitant, maybe a little bit reluctant, and maybe just don't have the background to do things like this. Could you speak to us a bit about your experiences in training your students to uh, use some of these resources, get comfortable with them, and can you also talk a little bit about how much time goes into training them and maybe what resources you've been able to point them to so they're able to use these materials? I think it's very important to start very slow. So for example, this is the first year I am trying the blog in my class, in my Spanish history class. So what I did, and I have to admit, I was not very sure what was going to happen, all right? Uh, so what I did, I created an activity in which I told them the entry needs to have 250 words, uh, you need to cite, you need to find a copyright image, you need to um, answer to two classmates, you need to make changes later on. And I kept them very specific deadlines. What I did in class was I had the blog already prepared and I spent the last 15 minutes of the class making sure everybody opened up their computers or their phones. They went to the website and they created the beginning of the first entry with me. So I, can't, I could travel short. Um, so the first time, not everybody followed the instructions as I had them written down and it was clear. So what I did later on, a, a couple of classes later, I said, oh, let's compare this entry and let's compare this other entry, one who had followed the whole instructions and the other one who has not, without naming or anything. But so which one do you like more? Which one do you think works better? What, which one has more content or which one is more interesting or which one is, so asking them questions so they could think themselves which one was working better and why. Uh, so that's the way I do spend time in class to focus on this technological component. And so at the beginning, the students were getting some images that were not totally copy free, right? And I was like, where did you get this information from? So let's find another one that we can actually use. So we went, to, we went through that a couple of times in the class and it's good time in class. Do not think that just because you are doing it, you're wasting time of your content class. Those are the skills that your students need and that we need to work in the professional world. And so we need those. 
regarding uh, those students who are less inclined to use technology, sometimes there is a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations and a lot of one-on-one -on -one working, but that's going to happen. Definitely. And I like that you have the piece in there for the reflections so students can take a look at different samples and think, okay, how can I change my work so that it can go up and a different level? So I love that piece. So it sounds like this training, it's not just a one-time thing that happens in the beginning of the course. That This is going to be a process that happens over time. And especially as you might change the nature of the submissions that students are doing, maybe we'll have some additional trainings for these types of skills. Yes, and what is also important is that you start um, in a simple manner and every time you add a different component that makes it more complex, but do it gradually. Don't do it all at the same time because then the students and we as instructors would be also be overwhelmed. But if we are doing one by one, slowly but steady, then uh, it's easier for everyone. And what is very important for us also when we are looking at the presentational mode and how we are students are selecting and adapting the materials is see what it works and if, what it doesn't work. When I was doing this blog, I realized that one of the steps I wanted, which was the students to rewrite the blog based on the comments, it didn't work at all. Like nobody did it. And I thought, well, then it shouldn't happen in because this is not what the blog is made for. So we shouldn't be using a tool for something that is not made for. So what I changed, so I look at other blogs, what people were doing in other blogs, which I thought I had done, but obviously I had to learn. And so I look at what other blogs were doing and I said, okay, so this is what we are going to do now. So instead of rewriting the blog, just write comments to, to what you're your classmates are telling you. And that's what we did. And this is working now. This is part, this is part of what the blog is. Glad to hear that it worked out. And hats off to you for being tenacious enough to say, okay, it didn't work the way that I was thinking it was going to work initially, but just being able to go in and give it another try. So hats off to you. And that sounds like that's working out really well for your students. So that's great. I did want to get into some other questions that we had surrounding some students, maybe at a lower level of proficiency. Um, I wanted to ask if there are some creative and fun ways for some presentational output for the students, maybe at those lower levels so where they're novice learners, they're more parroting things. Are there some ways that we could work some of these fun uh, interactive presentational assignments into the curriculum for the students at the lower levels? Uh, yes. I have, I have taught many years, I taught the lower level Spanish courses. Um, and that's, uh, that's actually when I started to use a lot of the technology. So the first tool I used was the, the wiki. And I used that with my Spanish 101 class. They didn't have any knowledge of Spanish when they came into the class, maybe hola, adios, and a little bit more. Uh, but what I did, and again, it was, what is important is to think was the final goal of the activity. So the final goal of the activity was to write a letter to a potential roommate. So throughout the first three weeks of the semester, everyone had a wiki and they have to write something related to what we had seen in class. So we started by learning how, what their name was and how old were they and what did they like and what didn't they like. So every time or oh, once a week, they had to go to the wiki and they have to include more information about themselves. And then, so they did that for a few weeks and then I put them in groups of three and among the three of them, they have to they have to write the letter to the first of all they had to write a letter to the potential roommate and they did that in the wiki but then my second attempt i asked them to do a digital story 
So what they did, what they brought in the wiki, which was a presentation of the three of them, what they liked, what they didn't like, what did they study, what, what the major was, what they liked to do in their free time, all those things that we learned in Spanish 101. So they created a video, um, a digital story, a video, and they present it to the whole class. And that was in a very lower, in a lower level class, and they did a beautiful job. So it can be done. Fantastic. I love to hear success stories like that, especially about students who are new to the language, maybe a little bit timid, and they are totally rocking in the online world. That's fantastic. Um, segueing in a little bit into the online world here, whenever you are going through your process of sitting with the students and explaining to them how they can use these tools to complete their assignments. What advice do you have for folks like me who are completely online and maybe have a little bit more limited access to our students? So we're not meeting them face to face, uh, but we want to make sure that our students are empowered and they feel uh, brave enough and confident enough to go ahead and do their assignments that are maybe a little out of their comfort zone in some of these newer um, technology mediums. Do you have advice for folks like me? I never taught a fully online course, <laughs> but uh, I think it's very important to have very, very clear instructions, both regarding how to use the tool and what is expecting from the assignment. What I have done with my tool, with my, my students, when I have a new tool, I have created small videos. I have used a screen customatic and I have told, I have shown them how to, if they have to do, uh, a narrated PowerPoint, I show them those are the steps that you need to follow to do a narrated PowerPoint. But instead of telling them in writing, just show it to them in, in, a, in a small video. Uh, that really helps with the students. And they, I put that in Blackboard or in the language management system that I have, and they have that library of content there. I think it's also very important that uh, we have very clear instructions and very clear rubrics of what, the, of what is expected to work because everything has to be tied together. I definitely want to ask about rubrics, but just going back to what you said with uh, Screencast-O-Matic and having those screencasts available, it's very important in the online world, but even in a hybrid or a face-to-face -face course, just having that guide there and available on demand for students so that yes. they can access it any time. And they're not thinking, what did my instructor say when they're sitting down at home and they're trying to figure out what to do? So that is fantastic. And that's great to hear that it's helpful, not only in face-to-face -face courses, but in our online courses yes. as well. Um, so do you have any specific rubrics that you might be willing to share with us uh, related to assessing multimodal presentations? I know that rubrics can be very open-ended, but is there anything that you can just think of off the top of your head or maybe something that you've used recently? So what I'm using for the blog right now, let me see if I remember correctly, they have, the rubric has several categories. One of them is for content. They need to cite sources. They need to have a copy uh, free write image. They need to answer to classmates because interaction is very important. You, you don't want to have a blog that is only where people are writing. You want to have students interacting about the different topics. And then they need to answer to their classmates' comments. And then the language. I look at the language a little bit. So that's for the blog right now. When I have done digital stories, I haven't done those for a while, but I was looking at the narrative. I was looking at the use of implicit and explicit images. Again, they had to be copy free write images. Uh, I was looking at the role of the music the pace, the use of the spaces between the different images, uh, everything that can convey a meaning, which not, doesn't have to be just the written, the oral word in the case of the digital story, but everything that goes with it. The use of the, when you go from one image to another, how you can do the fade in or the fade out, the transitions, 
are also part of the rubric because all those are elements that are helping create meaning. So anything that there is something that creates meaning, it has to be included. Definitely. Now, related to as students are going through, do you check drafts of the students' writings, for example, to make sure that they're not copying all the texts and making sure that they're actually expressing their ideas in their own words? And also, what to what extent do you accept paraphrasing? Um, you know, are you okay with just basic paraphrasing, or do you really want to make sure that they are including their own ideas into it? Or how much paraphrasing do you accept? Well, if we are writing on an argumentative or expository essay, they need to have a thesis, which is their own personal opinion. So everything that goes, that is going to support their personal opinion, their, their what they believe is true, or what they, whatever point they want to uh, point, everything has to go to support it. But it cannot be that they are just copying idea from a person, from another person, from another person. We need to hear the voice of the author. What is important is that when we are working on, on this type of presentational mode, a, like written mode, you always have to give feedback. And when, and when you're working on digital stories too, you always have to give feedback. And it can be a structured feedback, it can be peer feedback. And through that feedback that looks both at content, at language, at, can, and everything that goes included, the images, if it's the digital story, you, if the learner is not doing that by herself, you can help the learner to, to find their own voice. Sometimes it's about finding their own voices. Not that, our students don't want to copy and paste, but sometimes they have challenges finding their own voices. Definitely, and I love the idea of having a peer review as a way for them to bounce their ideas off of their peers and then maybe grow their own arguments based on conversations that they've had with their peers. I really do love that idea, that's fantastic. Now, with your um, presentations, whenever you make the class outputs public, at least I'm assuming you make the class outputs public, have you ever had uh, any experiences where maybe you're reached out to from somebody uh, that might have benefited from reading some of these uh, creations that your students have made? Do you have anything like that you might be able to share with us? No, right now. No, right now. I just did, I uh, have started the blog now, and I think it's so new that it hasn't gotten out there. Other work that has been done, I have done it privately. And the digital stories, some of them have been uh, public, but they're public for the students, so they would let me know if they have something. I cannot help you with that. No problem, but who knows, as this continues to get traction, yeah. you might have some yeah. feedback, so that's really good. Um, a question that actually just sort of I came up with now is, how do we make sure that we're doing a thorough enough job assessing the language and being able to sort of separate that from the technology, um, especially with some of my students who are less tech savvy, or in some cases, I have students who have very limited access to the computer and they're maybe coming into school for a few hours a day and they don't have internet access at home. How can we separate the two? Is that something that you do through the rubric? Mm -hmm. That's done through the rubric because when you have, for example, in this block rubric, the only technology component I have is that they need to include the categories of the, uh, um, categories was another element of the rubric, the categories of the blog, of the post um, and the copyright image, which is, I don't know if it's so much technology, but it's related to it. Uh, and then the language is different. We need to distinguish between the different components. And yes, not everybody has ac the same access to technology and we need to be aware of the differences. Mm -hmm. Definitely. 
And now for the students who maybe are a little bit reluctant, do you have any strategies that you use to motivate students? Um, some students may just be less interested in the presentational mode. Maybe it's uh, the technology, but how do you motivate those students who just don't want to engage or reluctant to engage with this? I just tell them this is goes beyond the class. This is a skill that they are going to need for their professional development. And I, in my class, yes, I do teach them language and I do teach them about the history of Spain. But my goal is to teach them to be successful, is to help them to be successful in their professional environment later on. These are skills that they will use. They might not be a block, but they might build something else and they will use some of the skills that they are learning in the class. So I go beyond my own class to tell them, this is another, we are talking about transferable skills all over the place. This is a transferable skill that goes beyond the language class. You can use that in your life. Definitely. I would think the motivation would increase if you're able to tell students that this is potentially something that you could put on a resume, that you created yeah. this blog, this multimedia yeah. presentation. Absolutely. Now, for those of us who teach uh, the students in the K-12 through setting, especially our uh, high school students, are there any FERPA concerns that we need to be aware of? Concerns? Yes, uh, related to uh, just student privacy and things like that. Yes. Um, I know that the school, well, the university system too has uh, some uh, con concerns. We can have uh, blogs that are public, but uh, we need to, wear, to be aware of the content. We need to be aware of what is happening. I know in the school system is much more uh, is much more careful and you might be able to answer that question better than I do. Uh, but I also know that they have fewer access to some of the resources in the classroom that our students might have at the university level. Definitely something to be mindful of. Another question that came in related to accessing materials. Um, one of our instructors has students in China and they might have very limited access to some of the resources uh, that we have here in the United States where we have a lot more freedom with our internet. Do you have any suggestions as to how we might be able to help students with limited access and not just in terms of technology, but in terms of what types of resources they can access? Well, I think that the internet might be a very, it's a very used resource, but it's not the only one. And sometimes we just go to it because it's easy. Every time I have a question, I don't go to a book. I just go to the internet and see what I get, and then I will go to a book. So it's just one more resource that we have, and we should be exploring other resources that we have. So in the case of the students who are in China, they might have other resources, and they might be savvier at using other resources instead of using the internet. So, and actually it would be good to have to use different resources now that I'm listening to that. We should be using different ones. Definitely. Um, the library. Uh, we often yes. forget about the fact that we do have these libraries yes. and they're full of these things called books that we haven't used in 20 years. But So I was really thinking about point. that. Maybe I should tell my students I need to go to the library and find something. Now, at your university, do you have resources at the library that might be able to help students who are new to um, some of these technologies or their trainings maybe through a library? One of our uh, participants mentioned that there are resources through her university where students can go to the university library system, get some trainings. Are there anything like that available at your school? There are some training uh, for some specific software. Uh, the training I have seen is more specific for research software. There might be something I am missing. Uh, a lot of the training that we give our students falls on us on the instructors. So we do have access to training to learn different tools. And sometimes we just get together and we just one of us is using a tool and we just teach each other how to use the tool among our faculty members. 
and then we just implement that in our classes. Excellent. So that could be another great resource for students to check out, especially if they're a little bit reluctant. Um, I do want to just remind everyone that our survey has been posted in the chat. Um, so if those of you who are listening in, if you can just take a few minutes just to give us a little bit of feedback on this presentation, uh, these help us to continue to hone our presentations and gear these toward us, our instructors. I have a question come through about um, comprehension and how this might be different from accuracy. And he's saying because it, it's accurate in terms of the pronunciation and the structure in the vocabulary, I think this question relates more to how do you assess accuracy versus comprehension whenever you have a project like this that's more open-ended and students will have potentially a lot of different ways where they can show what they know to you. Are we talking about oral production? I believe so in this in this context. I believe that's what we're asking about. So when we are uh, evaluating our students' work, we should be having different a different set of criteria. We should be looking at different categories. One of them could be accuracy. A person can be very accurate but do not say much. And a person can have very can have super detailed content, but the accuracy of the language might be not as strong as the other student. Um, a person can be comprehensible, but not be accurate. So in that case of being comprehensible is the meaning that is conveying is good enough that we can understand it. So that would be again going back to the rubric and having the different categories there. So if the learner, if you can understand, if we can understand the learner, well, that would be one category, but then if the accuracy is not that good, maybe we could just work on that part. Definitely, and that's where I could see how getting feedback, whether it be from the instructor, coming to an instructor's office hours, or maybe just sitting down with a peer and going over some things where students are able to get some feedback and continue to improve their output. I think that would be fantastic for something like this. Um, we had a question come through. Does the University of Maryland offer these courses for free or is there enrollment uh, fees related to that? The courses that I am talking about, uh, no, those are courses that we, our students enroll in these courses. And are any of the training resources, uh, maybe even if they're ones that you've created, are those available online that we might be able to point our students to if we decide to undertake a project like this? I could share my resources. I haven't posted them online. I definitely find that taking the time, as you said, to make these resources available, especially through things like web-based tutorials, where you're able to create a video and put a link to that right in your course and have the students click on that when they're ready to complete that portion of the project. I just have a lot of success with that. I find that students are much less likely to be frustrated and potentially decide that they're not going to work as part on the assignment. So um, those are great resources to have. So um, if anybody is looking to create assignments like this, I cannot stress enough the importance of creating tutorials like the ones you mentioned, where you're going through and explaining to students what exactly they need to do. So that way, they can focus more on the content that they're creating rather than getting frustrated that maybe the technology is not working the way that they're expecting it to. So thank you for including that as a suggestion. It's appreciated. Yeah. I also would say that technology changes all the time. And what was working two months ago might change. So that's, it's really important to be up to date. And I know this myself, I am not always up to date and I get to a new system and I don't know how to use it and I need to get used to it. So it's a learning process all the time. It definitely is. And as technology is going to continue to grow and change with us, it will be interesting to see if we're moving from more of a 
in your case, a blog format to maybe more of a vlog format, as it seems like most of the internet traffic has really switched away from being text-based and now a lot of it's video-based. So it'll be interesting to see what the future brings and how we as online educators are going to address some of the ways that uh, social media and media is changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I still hope that we keep the written text, the written blog, but because that's, I like the writing component, but yeah, it's going to be very interesting. Um, I want to say something about trying to be up to date. Um, and I'm going to say, I'm not always up to date with the tools. I am not a savvy user of Twitter and I'm not a savvy user of Instagram. And I try, I'm trying to learn how to use them, but it's also a matter of, talking about the reluctant learner or the learner who doesn't see the purpose and that's I'm thinking, why should I be doing this? So we need to give space to everyone to find the tools that they want to use. Uh, and we need to understand that not everyone sees the instructional purposes of the tools, but at the same time, we need to make them aware of why they could be important. Absolutely. And I find that even by using things like Twitter, social media, it's just another method in which I'm engaging with my students and sometimes even sharing a picture of my dog. That sometimes is a good way to build that connection with the yes. students, which is, is really important in the online world. The more that we're mm -hmm. connecting with our students, I think the better the outcomes are going to be. And uh, it's just interesting and fun to watch how technology is changing, how we interact with our students. And is the interaction that goes with the presentational mode? Because when you are sending a picture in Twitter, I'm sure there is also a small little line that goes along with it. My dog is doing blah, blah, blah. So just by doing that, you are interacting, but you are also presenting content. And it's a tool that is helping. And it's a very good tool that young people use now to for content and express meaning. Thank you very much. I had so much fun talking with you and just going through some of these great questions. Thank you to everybody who contributed questions in the chat. And again, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming out to speak with us on this topic. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. All of you.